Now, I would like to have a discussion based on Dr. Sasomek's presentation. Mr. Taira, I believe that venture businesses will be the key to the development of an R&D cluster, but are there any bio startups already existing in Okinawa? I think you touched on this earlier, but if you could elaborate a little bit more on Okinawa bio startups and uh, what their current status is. Yes, I uh, mentioned in my slides earlier, uh, I provided a list of bio startups here in Okinawa. Uh, but that said, I think that venture businesses in Okinawa are not quite there yet. That is, uh, I do believe that they will be something we can look forward to in the future. What we've seen in the last 10 years is that national and prefectural governments uh, together have supported research and development, they've supported innovation, and recently with industrial support measures, they've provided uh, a great deal of support funding and help to develop venture businesses. In my own experience, five years ago, I visited San Diego, and while I was there, I observed many venture businesses and development agencies. And what I heard over there is that in the 1960s, uh, the core UCSD was established, and at that time, the economy was heavily based on the military and tourism. In that sense, it was very similar to Okinawa. Uh, actually, many Okinawans live there. They get married to servicemen here, and then they move to San Diego. So I believe that there is a strong connection between these two places. Uh, that said, we don't have a hugely successful venture business yet that defines us, but I do believe that the preparations for such a venture business are steadily being developed. Uh, also, we shouldn't just think in closed terms, uh, just thinking about Okinawa, but rather in the spirit of open innovation mentioned earlier, uh, we should recruit excellent venture businesses from outside of Okinawa and support them and also have them collaborate with OIS. These are the things that we are working on right now. I'm also involved in the development of these venture support measures. I think we've been very successful in attracting businesses from mainland Japan, but the next challenge is starting a venture business which is based on globally competitive science. Could you please tell us about your experience in San Diego? Why was San Diego able to establish globally competitive venture businesses one after another? Is there some kind of secret? I think, first of all, you create very successful companies. Um, if you look at the family tree around companies like Qualcomm, which was actually developed with military uh, technology out of the Navy Research and Development in San Diego, or you look at companies like Hybertech, which was our first life sciences company, some of these people go on to start new companies and get funded by their friends. Others make enough money from the company they're in that they begin to create venture funds. We have created a number of venture funds that have typically specialized in, in uh, wireless communications and in life sciences. But when I look at my friend Sass over there, there nobody has competed yet with Sand Hill Road. Uh, I had John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins down one day, and I said, why doesn't Kleiner Perkins put an office in San Diego? And he said, we would know the good deals from Silicon Valley if they're there. And so I think every place thinks they need more venture capital than they get. But usually the best deals end up getting funded. We have a relatively small venture capital community in San Diego to this day. And yet we get more than a billion dollars in venture capital every single year. And in recent years, more than half of that has gone to the life sciences sector. 
先ほどあのご挨拶をいただいたルース大使は実は。U.S. Ambassador Roos, who spoke to us earlier, was actually a legal advisor for Kleiner Perkins. So the reason we were able to receive such a great speech on establishing venture businesses was because of his background in this area. And Kleiner Perkins, as you may be aware, was the founding investor of Genentech, which was the first biotechnology venture business. Okay, Mr. Tsukamoto, could you please tell us about the necessary business support in order to establish a cluster? Uh, a cluster is basically a number of businesses starting up in an area, followed by open innovation. So if this doesn't happen, frankly, we cannot have a cluster. So the problem with Japan, as Dr. Sa Somek pointed out, is that in terms of venture capital funding, uh, Israel and U.S. lead the way, while in Japan there's virtually none. So how can we overcome this problem? Since this is the real engine in terms of cluster formation, if we look around the world, other places have similar issues. Germany, for example, is a place where there was not a lot of venture capital funding. So, to a degree, the government had to step in and match funds. And although there's a debate on how successful that was, that was their solution. So the initial stage where there's not a lot of venture capital in Japan, steps need to be taken such as uh, what's happening here in Okinawa where funds are made available or even at the national level where uh, the Innovation Network Corporation of Japan can function to a degree. The other important thing is, uh, well, if you ask whether or not Japan actually has funds, the answer should be yes and plenty of it. Uh, different companies like pharmaceutical companies have capital but they just are not using it. And I often talk to the heads of pharmaceutical companies and they say that if Japan had an angel fund type system that applied to companies and if the company were able to receive tax incentives for investing, they would invest as much as they had. So these kinds of arguments exist. And I think there's a great chance to kickstart uh, this cluster building if a combination of funding from the national and local government were made available and special tax incentives were created in, for example, special economic zones in Okinawa. On the other hand, however, if these steps aren't taken, the cluster may never get off the ground. I also think that what you just mentioned regarding tax deductions for high-risk investments is very important. I also think that while Japan has saved a lot in public pension money, the performance of these funds is very poor. In the U.S. in the 1980s, actually, and this is one of the reasons that a Genentech IPO was possible, is that there was a deregulation in which less than 3% of public pension money was made available as risk money to invest. Even with strict management of public pension in Japan, uh, we've ended up far in the red, so I believe that we should be considering making risk money available for investment in a similar manner in the future.